know, he's a behemoth of a guy. Big old, you know, big old guy. So he's sitting there like getting up inside of their, their armpits and twisting their scapulae and like working the muscles into the right location. Like, you wouldn't believe it, okay? It looks terrifying. Folks, he's working on them. You gotta see the changes. Like in an hour of therapy, man. In an hour of therapy, the guy's like, oh, this is all I got. And then at the end, he's like, oh, yeah, yeah that works pretty good. That works pretty good. There it all goes. I already there it all goes. Excuse That's me. Fine. We don't let you knock it out. <laughs> Gliding movements, things kind of gliding past one another. Angular movements like flexion and extension, all right? Uh, decreasing angles, increasing angles. Uh, did I do? Yes, it's perfect. Uh, abduction and adduction. Again, abduction, raising the arms. Abduction, lowering the arms. You can do the same thing with the legs, all right? And then pronation, supination, which we've already described. But to pronate is to put the thumbs down. To supinate is to bring the thumbs back around, palms up. Soup, not soup, all right? So we use these concepts, we use these concepts. Now, here is a killer uh, description of the knee. And what I'm gonna do is, I'm just gonna run you through the parts of the knee and kind of talk to you about what they do. Uh, so it's all there, it's all there. Let's talk about the ligaments and things. Yeah, I got 12 plus for a C. Uh, uh, I said 16 in class, didn't I? It's 12 plus, I, I'm sure I've read 16 somewhere. Uh, let's talk about these these joints and, or these ligaments, I should say. All right, <clears throat> away we go. Here is a right leg. All right, here's a right leg, and on this right leg there are four major ligaments that we need to describe. All right, uh, and I'm going to get to those second. Let's do the easy one in the front first. So what is this? Aspatella. What kind of bone is a patella? A flat bone. It is a knee bone. Flat bone. Flat bone. Uh, better no. term. It's in a tendon, so what is it? Sesmoid. Who's talking? Yes, good job. Sesmoid bone. I didn't hear it. I didn't hear it. Hey, moving on. Sesmoid bone. So this is the tendon coming down from what's called your, your quadriceps. In reality, it's the tendon of the rectus femoris, the big muscle right in the middle of your quadriceps, but it's commonly just called the quadriceps tendon. Everybody with me? Like mm -hmm. All these, these are quads. Do we agree? Yes. All right. So this is the tendon coming off the rectus femoris. It comes down, it connects to the patella. Now, muscle to bone, it makes us a tendon, quadriceps tendon, do we agree? Yes. And then it goes bone to bone. And what is bone to bone? It's a ligament, okay? And that ligament we call the patellar ligament, all right? Now you'll oftentimes hear this whole thing just called the quadriceps tendon, okay? But it depends on what book you read. In my opinion, this is bone to bone, so that's the patellar ligament, okay? What do I call it here? Patellar ligament, good, we're making progress. All right, <clears throat> so as your quads flex, it calls you to kick your leg out, and that would actually be extension, okay? Flexion would be done by the muscles under here pulling this down. Extension would be done by the quads, kicking the leg back out. Everybody with me? Mm -hmm. All right, now then, there are the four major ligaments of the knee. These are called the collateral ligaments and the cruciate ligaments, of which there are two each. Let's do the collaterals first, because they're easy. All right, that's the right leg. And that's the plate off the bottom right there. On this right leg, would that be lateral or medial? Lateral. Lateral, so that's the lateral collateral ligament. And this one must be the medial. medial collateral ligament. Now what these do is they keep the leg from rocking side to side. If you grab your finger, it's basically your knee. Okay, that's pretty much your knee in reality. Same shape, so I mean, it's all there. You try to tweak it from right to left, you feel it get tight on the sides. Mm -hmm. All right, you can feel it. That is those collateral ligaments. If you kind of grab your leg and go side to side with it, in another world where this was okay, in a lab we would just throw people up on a table and have your lab partners grab you by the leg and twist it side to side. That has changed. Um, it 
it oh, really right. wants to be on the ground. So That's I'm not it wants to be, fate. it's fine. I'm not chancing fate twice. <laughs> so it wants to be on the ground? Yeah. Uh, so the collateral limits keep the leg from going side to side. Everybody with me on this? Mm -hmm. Collateral limits. Then there are the cruciate ligaments. All right, cruciate ligaments. So there's an anterior cruciate ligament, which everybody loves to hate. We call it the... Good. Then there's a posterior cruciate ligament. You can take a wild guess as to where these are found. Anterior means in the... Fine. Posterior. Good. I take the whole knee and I turn it around backwards so you can see it. The posterior cruciate ligament is this. All of this, these two little shreds here, that's all PCL. And what the PCL does is it keeps the leg from hyperextending. So if you kind of take your foot, ooh, I can feel that. Oh, man. You kind of give it a push backwards. You can feel, or alternatively, take your finger and kind of hyperextend. You can feel that ligamentation on the back of this get tight. Right? That is the posterior cruciate ligament on this knee here. And then there's the ACL. All right? We don't go side to side. We can't hyperextend, but the knee must bend like this, right? So the ACL is a weird one. Uh, the ACL comes in, see it right in the middle, All right? Connects to that um, tibial prominence. Give me time. We'll get to there in a minute. Connects to the tibia at the top there. Okay. Hang on, I gotta friggin' click through here for 10 seconds. Tell me I got a tibia on this lecture. No tibia on this lecture, that's life. Anyway, it's where the ACL connects. It'll come to me in a minute. Like the other day, I can remember scapula. All right, here we go. So you can see the ACL kind of connect right in the middle. You see it? And it goes right in the middle of the knee, right at the center core. It's called an intercapsular ligament because it's inside the capsule of the knee. So what the ACL does is it keeps the knee from shimmying off of its base like this, all right? So what the ACL does is it keeps the knee from pulling off of its base. So again, here's your knee. Can't go right and left because it's collateral. Can't hyperextend because it's posterior. Cruciate. But it must bend. But what it can't do is shift off of its base. It can't, everybody looking, can't pop off this way because the ACL is there to prevent that. That's why this is a really common sporting injury. Somebody stops, somebody chops them in the legs, shifts off its base, torn ACL. That, that's how this works. Right? Why doesn't the ACL here, let me try again in English. Why doesn't the ACL heal, there we go, when it's torn? You don't heal an ACL. That's true, there's not a lot of blood flow to it. If you look at an ACL, I mean, it is white as the day is long. I mean, it is very, very translucent, silvery S, meaning collagen fiber. No blood flow. Everybody with me? Yes. So, I'll be the only way it gets nourishment to stay alive is from the snow loop where it brings things to it. So, very little to no blood flow. Further, if you tear this thing into two pieces, is there anything to realign it? It just floats around in there, man. It just floats around in that joint capsule. And worse than that, uh, when things are floating around in the joint capsule, every time you step, the knee is kind of squishing them. And as it squishes them, it releases inflammatory chemicals. If you tear your ACL, by the time you go to the doctor to have it checked on, most of the ACL has been eaten away by macrophages, white blood cells inside. It's pretty much gone already. There is no healing it, all right? So what do we do? We replace it. Yeah, man, we crack that sucker open and throw a new one in. So hold that thought. Let's get to that in a second. Let me describe meniscus one more time, and then we'll move on. Am I, do you not like my descriptions? Does it sound terrible? Yeah, yeah I've, I've seen a lot of stressed out people when I give these lectures. I've had some terrible times explaining stuff to folks. They're like, oh, no, and I'm like, what's the matter? And they're like, I gotta go to the doctor this weekend to have this. Yeah, I'm like, I'm so sorry. <laughs> sorry, we don't want to tell so you. so harsh to describe these things in the ways I describe them. Or imagine me, whenever I'm like injuring my back or something, I'm like, what I've done. Yep. I don't want to go. I don't want to go get this checked. I don't want to hear about my discs. I enjoy I talking about how I didn't play sports and thus I have healthy joints. And now here I am with a disc injury. 
All right, here we go. Meniscus, lateral meniscus, medial meniscus. What's meniscus made of? What kind of cartilage? What kind of cartilage is your meniscus made of? We talked about this two hours ago. Hyaline cartilage lines the ends of the bones, but the fiber cartilage is what makes up the meniscus, all right? So remember, the meniscus are these little cups, all right? Little cups where the condyles of the uh, femur sort of sit on top of the tibia. These little cups. You don't have to have them, but they help. All right? They help. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Fiber cartilage. Should I ask them again? One more. So what is meniscus made of? Fiber. Is there hyaline in there too? Yes, on the outside. You better believe it. So the fiber cartilage just makes up meniscus which some synovial joints have, synovial joint, freely moving, diarthrotic, uh, but not all. Good. Mm. Let's throw points at you guys so you can tell me who that is. Woo! Uh, Lord have mercy, he's terrifying. Back in- Is that like, Randy Couture? No. Back in the late play. 90s, early 2000s. Boyce Gracie? Vanderlei Silva. Vanderlei Silva. Terrifying human. That is a, I wouldn't tell you most of them are terrifying. Moving on. Uh, you'll see he's got his leg raised up in the air there. Why is that? He's yeah, taking yeah. a he's taking a kick. And he's taking a kick right in the leg. But if I'm sitting there planted and you kick me in the side of the leg, Keontae, yeah. man, I'm gonna blow out some ligaments. L ligaments don't like going sideways. Everybody with me on this? Mm -hmm. They don't like going sideways. You can see the difference in size of the collaterals here, you know, comparatively. Like this one's real weak comparatively. Uh, you don't like side blows to the knees. It's a good way to blow out a lot of these ligaments, meniscus, what have you. Imagine this meniscus is relatively firm and you kind of really shove it sideways. It tears. Torn meniscus is a real thing. Do we all agree with this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Side, side blows, lateral blows are real bad. Uh, rapid directional changes. These are all ways of taking care of our ligaments here. Uh, you've probably heard the term sprain, tear. Yes, this kind of thing. Okay, so a sprain ligament sprained ligament normally the way we phrase this is a sprain is where the ligament's been stretched a little and some of the fibers are kind of busted up but it, it, it's still intact and it'll heal that's a sprain a tear it's in two pieces and it may be more work to get it put back together if you're torn atl you're replacing that atl do we agree yes if you can strain things all day long you're going to hurt and suffer as a result but it's going to heal back over time but a tear you got other problems and it's kind of the same story with cartilage again what color is cartilage why? Oh man, that silvery white color. Whenever we do our first like fun dissection, you're gonna see it and you're gonna I get it. Like you've been saying this this whole freaking time. Silvery white, what does that mean? I totally see it now. Like cartilage has a look to it. It's wild. Uh, same thing with, with um, ligaments, tendons, ooh, for that matter. Uh, so they are avascular. What does that mean? No blood. No blood flow. And that means that they heal slowly, if at all. Okay, cartilage damage either is going to heal very slowly or not at all. Uh, and that's how this works. Yeah, which is why I'm hoping my back will get better and better and better. And I would like to think that it is, but I'm also very hopeful in most things. Uh, loose bodies. Now, I kind of mentioned this a second ago. The nature of it is as follows. Normally, when cartilage tears, there will be little bits that are broken off. And these little bits of cartilage, uh, you guys remember the Princess and the Pea story when you were a kid? Mm -hmm. All right, okay, it's kind of like that. You've got a little bit of cartilage broken loose and it's sort of floating around inside the joint cavity or even a piece of ligament kind of flopping around in there in the joint cavity. Every time you step, they release inflammatory chemicals. Those inflammatory chemicals end up tearing up the inside of the knee's cavity or any joint cavity for that fashion. Uh, so our loose bodies or bits of whatever that have broken loose in there uh, will release all these inflammatory chemicals and macrophages come in and just tear into the cartilage. They don't care what it is, they're just tearing into it. So when you've got a loose body, something floating around inside of the knee or anywhere for that matter, we just think about knees because they're, you know, what most folks damage, uh, you're going to end up with osteoarthritis if you don't get it taken care of. Because the body's going to tear up all the cartilage that's there and you're going to wind up with bone-to-bone -bone contact and it's never coming back after that. So knees are something we need to have addressed. Joint, joint issues are something to be addressed whenever they come up. Yeah, we've already talked about dislocations. All right, what kind of surgery is this? The scope, arthroscopic, right? To scope a joint. 
And what you're going to have here is a uh, irrigation system basically to inflate the knee and a small camera to see and then a tool coming in from the other side so that you can do work inside the knee. So look, look at this. What color is it? It's white. Because what does it not have? Blood no blood. blood. All right, no blood flow. You can see the loose body here where it's been torn loose. Yeah, I mean, that's literally what's happening here. You can see the loose body there. Here you can see some sutures that have been that have been put in place on some meniscus, kind of help hold it together, tibia, femur, part of the meniscus. Uh, here is what the tear would look like otherwise. Here are some brand new polymers we're using to go in and replace meniscus. And this is an ACL repair. Shall we discuss the old ACL repair? Uh, that doesn't look good. All right. When you have an ACL tear, what we do is we go in and harvest a piece of ligament or tendon from somewhere else in the body. Where does it often come from? Yeah, man, I've, I've heard that one. I've seen a little bit of uh, patellar ligament taken before, uh, a, a variety of places we can do this. To be frank with you, I am pretty surprised we don't use polymers at this stage. And why wouldn't you? Anyway, neither here nor there. I am not an arthroscopic surgeon. I bet there's a reason. Moving on. Uh, so what we do is we drill a hole straight through the knee. Zip, zip, all the way through one end to the next. And we uh, use a couple of these, these very super special polished titanium screws that bone like, okay? So basically the idea here is you put this screw into the bone and after a short period of time, the bone kind of grows in and around it and encapsulates it to hold it in place. Everybody with me? We like titanium for this specific purpose. Uh, normally, the immune system can't sense it, whereas iron's constantly releasing, or releasing ions and stuff, so the body knows it's there. Inflammatory response. Uh, so the nature of this is that we, we put these screws in with the ligament attached to it, and then we can tension them, bend the leg, tension them, bend the leg, basically customize the tension of the knee uh, around what is necessary then sew the person up, call them a day. You know, it's done and done. After a few months, it'll heal up pretty good. And normally, you hear a lot of surgeons say, it'll be stronger after the surgery than it was before because they can custom tension everything and get it exactly the way they want it. Works like a charm. I've known lots of athletes with ACL repairs, and they all seem to come back like a champ. Uh, a friend of mine, well, a guy I know, uh, he played for Tampa after he had his ACL fix who went to college with fixed ACL, went through pro football with fixed ACL, and was good. I mean, obviously, playing, playing for long. So yeah, yeah, ACL repairs, they are pretty nice, as compared to what we were discussing earlier, the hip repairs that we're talking about. Yeah, it'll do. Oh yeah, we gotta talk about arthritis. That's a fact. All right, osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, and gout. <clears throat> Man, have we been talking about osteoarthritis this whole time? I feel like we have. Lover, yeah. This is uh, facts of life. You live long enough, you're gonna have osteoarthritis. It's just, you know, it's just how it goes. Uh, so as we age, we are constantly moving around and doing the things that we do, and we're releasing inflammatory chemicals to our cartilage. And over time, the replacement of the cartilage slows down to a point that you end up with bone-to-bone -bone contact, and that's osteoarthritis. It's hurt, it's painful. Uh, the body starts laying down excess bone in the areas where there's bone-to-bone -bone contact. So grandma's got these big old knuckles. Anybody ever seen this? Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Classic osteoarthritis, man. Classic osteoarthritis. Um, you just, this is a fact of life. As we age, you know, it's gonna happen. So prepare yourselves. If you live long enough, you're gonna have osteoarthritis. It's just like, again, grandma on her cracky knees. Classic osteoarthritis, man. Uh, rheumatoid. Rheumatoid is an autoimmune disease. What is rheumatoid arthritis? It is an autoimmune disease. Do we agree? Yes. This is where the immune system attacks typically the synovial membranes. And as the immune system attacks the synovial membrane, it basically turns it into sandpaper. Do you ever see these? It's like grinding away the cartilage wherever the rheumatoid arthritis is. Yeah. Uh, we, we have you know medications we can use to decrease the effects of this leveling. Uh, but it's no fun, it's not fun. Uh, so what's happening here is when you have the uh, nodal membranes break down, you're gonna have rubbing against the bone and over time it's gonna tear off all the cartilage and damage it to a point that the bones kind of misalign and then they sort of ossify and misalign to nature, okay? Especially if this is untreated. So I, like I had a professor, she was amazing, Dr. Adams, I may have mentioned her to you guys before, she taught anatomy of phys. 
and like this hand was like all curled over and it's kind of stuck in place like this. And it's from rheumatoid. Okay, it's totally rheumatoid arthritis. She was like, yeah, I gotta go into the doctor's office and they'll have to you know, pronate as much as I can and supinate as much as I can. It's their, their way of measuring our joints. And I was like, oh, light bulb. That's how this works. And that's why we're learning about all this. That is why, folks, that's why. Yeah, key point, autoimmune disease, rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis, back to fly. Yeah. me the question from either because I'm not. I'm they not clearly know more than I do about this. They've been to lots of medical school, right? Mm -hmm. But I'm thinking like that would be the case for her to have like these other issues starting like to explain if it's something else. Okay, look, look, look. Don't ask me to, don't bust up in there and be like, hey, you know what my anatomy professor, oh, no, Mr. No. Hopper, he <laughs> says, <laughs> y'all are mistaken. Because that ain't the way this works. But, uh, there's a famous phrase in the car world, okay? When you've gone through and you rebuild something and you, you replace and whatever, and you go to crank the car and it don't start now, it's something you did. It ain't even something random. Chance of it being something random, pretty limited. It ran, you changed the alternator, now it doesn't run. Probably something you did, all right? If you worked on the knees and you're augmenting the, the general, you know, alignment, the geography, not geography, geometry, yeah, of how the, the joints articulate with one another, and then she's got her hips hurting, that makes perfect sense to me. Now it's her back now, it's a little like That makes even more sense to me, but don't ask me, because I don't know. Is that a fair no, no, comment? No, 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 with, with those symptoms that you're triggered by any of autoimmune. Sure, it's possible. Moving on. Uh, then there's gout. Uh, ladies, congratulations. Yet again, I feel like. Uh, gout's really a male thing for the most part. Uh, something about how we accrue certain uh, nucleic acids. So, something about how males accrue certain nucleic acids. So when you eat foods that are really rich, um, think like preserved meats. Like if you're chowing down a prosciutto every night, you know? Killer cheeses, you're like tearing into some Pavarti. Like really rich food is what I'm saying. Deli sandwiches are the classics of this, but normally they just say red meat, but deli sandwiches can break that. I mm -hmm. think it's purine nucleic acids, but don't quote me on that, okay? Uh, foods that are rich in purine, they will cause a buildup of um, uric acid inside the body. And when you have built up uric acid, the kidneys aren't keeping up with it as well as they should, you can have that uric acid to make it begin to crystallize, there we go, that's the words I wanted in the order I wanted them. Uh, they begin to crystallize and form crystals of uric acid in joint cavity. Yet again, princess and the P, you understand what I'm getting at here. You get a crystal of uric acid formed up in a joint cavity, how's it gonna feel when you're moving around? Like crap. It's gonna hurt. Now, where does this typically pop up? Uh, I've seen feet. Big toes, it's called out gout, where it tends to pop up for the first time. You get this weird big toe issue, you're like, oh man, I think it's that. Kills me. Oh man, it's hurt so bad. It's like having a little rock inside of a joint. You know when a rock goes up in your shoe. How uh, irritating that is. That extends the joint cavity itself. All right. This is some kind of ridiculous extreme. Normally you don't see this. All right. Normally you don't see it. We're talking about small microscopic crystals. They're sharp edges. Sharp edged. There we go. Uh, and they cause all sorts of pain when you're moving around because they're tearing into the cartilage and leading to damage. And anytime you're releasing in like bradykinin or something in the joint cavity. Hurt. Yeah, 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 that'll do. Now, there are also foods that sort of help with this for whatever reason. Uh, normally, anything that's uh, red, ripe fruit, like the classic example, are uh, uh, black cherries. For whatever reason, they really help with gout, I'm told. 
Uh, and I've had students write this up before and bring it in, and there's evidence. There's good evidence that says that certain red rug fruits, probably antioxidant capacities they're in, uh, help us deal with uh, suffering from that. Mm. So that's how that works. Mm. Uh, let's go. Okay, lab time. Lab time. If I had all the time in the world, 